trial that would mark all trials of all time. Trials in that time were supposed to be held during the day. You were allowed to have a witness. The Sanhedrin met at night, and they brought in no witnesses. They knew Pilate would be meeting in the next morning, so they wanted to get together and bring about this whole trial before Jesus. And the whole thing crescendos in verse 12 of Mark chapter 15 with a question that is summary of that verse, what will you do with Jesus? That is a question of the Lenten season, what will you do with Jesus? What have you done with Jesus? What do you as a person choose to do with Jesus? Stormy O'Mardian says of herself, I was so miserable there was no hope for my life. I tried all kinds of drugs and alcohol, Eastern religions, the occult, and they didn't work. I had tried bad relationships, and that didn't work. Finally, one of my friends took me to a church. There I sat down with the minister, Jack Hayford, Church on the Way. Jack Hayford listened to me and heard my questions and heard about my journey and then said, why don't you take the screw tape letters of C.S. Lewis and the Gospel of John, take it home and read it, and how about we get together in about a week? And so she did. She came back at the end of the week and sat down with Jack Hayford who then explained the plan of salvation to her. We were all born sinners and we all need a Savior. And what you read in that Gospel of John was about the Savior, Jesus Christ, and He could forgive all sin, even hers. And she said, that's what I want. I want to invite Him into my life. And she said, in that moment, I did invite Him into my life. I kept going to church, she said, reading the Bible, praying, and doing what God said, and I was finding the way. As I walked with the Lord, the burdens that I'd been carrying for so long were stripped away, one layer at a time. And I have talked to person after person after person who has found that type of similar truth to be their reality when they have come to Jesus and opened their heart to Him. He has answered question after question, removed layer after layer of excuses, and helped them define and discover what it is to have a relationship with our Creator, as Pastor Justin prayed about just a little bit ago in the prayer. This morning, I want to ask you to keep your Bible open or logged on, if you would, to Mark chapter 15, and I want to look at three groups of people as we consider the question, as we consider the question, what will you do with Jesus? It's an age-old question. Others have preached it more eloquently and more profoundly, perhaps, but when it comes to your front porch and it sits on your lap, what will you do with Jesus? It cannot be more important of a question ever asked to us. So we point the first question to the first group of people, the Sanhedrin. They would accuse Jesus on false charges, the Scripture would say. The Sanhedrin are made up of about 71 or 73 people. They are the chief priests, the religious leaders, and they create what we would possibly call a Supreme Court. And so cases would go before them to be tried. They would listen to the case. They had their rules of how they were supposed to handle them, as I said a little bit ago. They had more rules than that, but they had those rules, and they were supposed to deal with these. But they are meeting at nighttime, the Scripture says to us in verse 1, and they are meeting then with their thought of what to do with Jesus. What do you want to do with Him? The Sanhedrin said, well, we know that what we want to charge Him on is blasphemy. But if we charge him on blasphemy, which means he has gone against God and the teachings of truth, if we charge him with that, the Roman government, who is really over us, would never allow us to do what needs to be done on our own because our own laws say we cannot crucify someone or put them to death for such thing. But if we'll take him to Pilate, (laughs) if we'll take him to Pilate, he will definitely have the right to put him to death. So since they knew that blasphemy would not be able to be a charge that Pilate would even care about because he didn't care about the Jewish faith, they said, we have to have some charges that will stick when we go to court. So we've got to make up something. We've got to create a hoax that will work, that will create some kind of a a believable stance and position that, oh, Pilate will buy into. 
If we can do that, then Pilate's going to be able to say, yeah, we're going to put him down now. And so you know what they did? Your Bible talks about it in Luke chapter 23 and verse 2. Your Bible will start talking, and it says there were three charges they came up with on Jesus. It said, number one, he is, he is undermining the nation. When he goes around doing what he's doing, it undermines the civility. It undermines the leadership. It undermines everything that is good that we have known to be right about our culture. He is doing it. He also opposes the payment of taxes to Caesar. Now, I want to ask you a question today. Did Jesus oppose the payment of taxes to Caesar? No. But they said that. He opposes the payment of taxes to Caesar because Pilate hadn't been out there to hear his teaching. So here it is. And he claims to be Christ, which means king. He claims to be Christ. When we say Jesus Christ, we're saying Jesus king. Messiah, anointed one, appointed one. That's what we're saying. And so he says, well, he claims to be. So they go before Pilate in the morning. And they say, Pilate, here is the one. Here's what he has done. And they lift him up and say, he is nothing. They are the elite of the Hebrew people, the elite of the Israeli group. And so they are bringing Jesus right here before Pilate. On earth, among human standing, Pilate was as high as they were going to go for this particular trial. This trial was one that would bring a verdict just as a question must bring a verdict in our thinking. What will you do with Jesus? The elite among us, the people who would be over us, very often have an opinion about something. Sometimes we allow ourselves to be governed by the opinion of other people. We listen to what Hollywood says, and we allow ourselves to be embracing the teachings of those people that seem to be among the elite. We listen to sports figures, and we will say, well, surely their voice matters most. They're the richest among us, the most talented among us, so we must listen to them. Some people get together, and they vote somebody into an office. They stay there 250 years, and we say, well, they must be the truth. We listen to them as the truth. But what really comes down to the answer that we're looking for? Is it just the elite? Is it just the appointed as the Sanhedrin were appointed? Or could there be a higher truth, even than a truth represented by Pilate? I remember sitting in eighth grade literature class, and I sat there with some of the kids who parents had old money. You know what that is. That's money handed down from generation to generation. And I remember still when one across the room when the teacher said, called on Kevin, there were two of us in the class, and, and I still remember one of the girls looking across the room at me and said, oh, that Kevin Sleezo, referring to me. That stung. I said to her, you cannot help who you were born to and where you were born. You've done nothing to achieve excellence in your family. I know you. I know who your dad is. And you have done nothing but be born into that family. You need to be quiet. (laughs) Mrs. Thompson, our teacher, did not evidently hear the first comment but heard mine. She says, Kevin, do you want to go to the office? I said, I'm not going to the office. I did not want to go there. And I don't want her talking to me the way she just did. Fortunately, Mrs. Thompson caught the atmosphere of fear in the room. She did not send me to the office. I was very livid at that point before Jesus, and I was not a happy man. I took my family back to Missouri a few years ago. I said, I've never been to the First Presbyterian Church in town. I'd like to go. I don't know who goes there. Some of the others that had been among those in that class and in my growing up years that had kind of looked down their nose. We walked in, our family did, my wife, my three kids, we sat toward the back third of the church. When they sang, we knew the hymns, we sang the hymns, we sang them joyfully, we sang them comfortably, not too loud, but we knew them, we sang them. 
I sat right behind one of those guys that had snubbed me while going to school. The girl who had made the repulsive comment to me was sitting two rows ahead. Her dad, rather, was sitting two rows ahead. Excuse me, she was not there. I found out her story. She and her brothers had gotten into drugs, and she died, never really knowing Jesus. The fellow sitting right ahead of me and to my side when the service was over was a kid I had played on the playground with, had gone to grade school and junior high and high school with. We graduated together. I realized I was older, looked different, part of my hair now, didn't then, Beatles look then, a little different look now, a few more pounds and all of that. Turned around, had no time of day for me at all, none. I reminded him who I was, none. His mother turned around in embarrassment and kindness and welcomed us to the service. If I had listened to them, if my father had listened to their fathers, my family history and line would have been a lot different. Ladies and gentlemen, I say it today, I don't care who says what in your life. I don't care who the Sanhedrin are in your world. You deal with the question yourself. Whoever you are, I don't care what background you are coming from, and you must answer the question yourself, what will you do with Jesus? It does not matter what the actors say. It does not matter what the athlete says. It does not matter what the politician says. The only thing that matters is your answer to the question, personally, what will you do with Jesus? Many have looked at Jesus and they have considered the claims of Christ and said he's a phony. One day while in Kansas City, I was there with a number of people. I got to meet Josh McDowell that day. Josh, during the presentation, came down, put his hand on my shoulder, and talked from right there for a while. And our cousin knew him and his family and spent some time socially with him. Josh set out to prove the claims of Christ were no good, and they were crazy lies, and they were of no value whatsoever. But he said, the longer I studied and the more I researched and the further I went with this whole thing, I began to realize that Christ was not a phony. The historical facts all point to the understanding that Jesus Christ is not a lunatic. He's not a liar. But in his famous statement, he is Lord. I ask you the question today, just like Josh McDowell, in your intellectualism, what will you do with Jesus? The question is yours. And then we ask a second crowd, second group. We ask the crowd itself, what will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? As a video showed a bit ago, they were calling out. They were calling out. They wanted the crucifixion of Jesus. The chief priests among the Sanhedrin, in verse 11 of our passage, had stirred up the crowd. And they basically want them to go against Jesus because they say of Jesus. Well, he he has done all these things to subvert the nation. He has done all these things to blaspheme our God. You've got to be able to put him aside. You've got to do something with him to put him down. He cannot have this. Now they had an odd custom, to us anyway. Verse 8 points to it. On Passover, Passover, which was commemorating the Exodus, whenever the blood was sprinkled over the doorposts and the angel passed over those home, but death hit the firstborn of every other family and more. Another message, another day. But here they're going to observe the Passover, and so the custom now is to release a prisoner. And so Pilate would come out, and he would say, hey, who do you want me to release? And the crowd has been stirred up. Perhaps some of these have come there to to say this. Some of these have come there to affect the release of Barabbas. And they would say, We want you to give us Barabbas in verse 11. Barabbas in verse 7 had been part of a riot. And as he was part of that riot that had happened and taken place there, there was a murder. So here he is, a criminal, a part of a murder, and he is someone who is absolutely proven to be a bad guy, already incarcerated. And yet they say of Jesus, the one you just sang about, the one you just came here to church and heard about in the scriptures. The one I'm talking about while I preach. 
the one some have raised their hands to, some have said amen to, the one we prayed to just a little bit ago. They are standing there and saying, we want you to crucify Jesus. Give us Barabbas. Now, it's very likely these are different Jews than the ones who cried Hosanna earlier. They are more from the Galilee side. These are more from the Jerusalem side. We would understand that. But when Matthew writes about this in 27 and verse 25, he says it this way. The crowd said, his blood will be on us and our children. That's how much they wanted Jesus crucified. Do you see the influence a Sanhedrin had over them? Do you see the influence people can have over others? Do you see what can happen whenever somebody just decides there's a certain mindset we ought to embrace? That's what's happening right now in Ukraine. But that can happen to you as a person. To where you allow yourself to be governed by the opinions of others around you and you do not come to grips with the question yourself. What will you do with Jesus? Not what will your mother do? Not what will your grandmother do? I talked to somebody not long ago and they asked him about their personal faith in Christ and they said, well, my grandmother was a Christian and she went to church all the time. I said, politely, your grandmother's not standing here and I'm not talking to her. I am talking to you, and now I'm talking to you. What will you do with Jesus? Not what will they do, with, what will you do with Jesus? I referred to it the other day, and I re, just uh, repeat it now. A number of years ago, we had a service on the ball field, and while out there at the ball field, I preached a message, and the message that I preached that day was about the rich young ruler who came to Jesus asking the question, what do I have to do to get eternal life? And Jesus said, you've got to believe on the Lord. You have to trust in him. And he says, I'm not going to do this. Jesus said to him, go sell everything you have. Give the poor and then come and follow me. And he, I'm not going to do that. He was rich. He was young. He was upward mobile, type A, entrepreneur. He had no time to do that, but he did want eternal life. And Jesus said, well, if you want that, you've got to receive me because I am the way, truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but by me. I am the way. And I've preached that message and I titled it Missing Heaven by 18 Inches. You've got it here. Mental ascent, but you do not have it here. Have you opened your life? You know, when Pastor Justin was, was talking to us a bit ago, he, he talked about Cornelius and surrendering all areas of life, not just our sins, but all areas of our life to God and let him be Lord. And that's what he wants from us in this Lenten season. And then let's go look at Pilate just for a little bit. Listen really fast, please. Pilate here, he holds a trial for Jesus. He questions Christ with no witnesses. Did you notice that? Verse 2, are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say. Jesus and Pilate are miles apart in their definition of king, aren't they? Pilate means you're going to sit on a throne somewhere around here. Where are you going to sit? Where are you going to sit? You're going to take over my throne? What do you think you're going to do? What's up with this? In John chapter 18, verse 33, if you go there, pick it up in chapter 18 of John in verse 33. Here it is. Then Pilate went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you king of the Jews? Jesus says, Is that your own idea? Or did you talk to others about me? In other words, do I have any witnesses? See, he was supposed to have witnesses there. Jesus said, let's follow the law. He wasn't being smart. Pilate said, am I a Jew? Am I a Jew? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you've done? Pilate says. Now Jesus starts answering that business about being king, right? Here he goes. Look at this. Verse 36. He said, my kingdom not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. Peter and others would already have the swords, he's saying, really. But my kingdom is from another place. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to remind you the kingdom of God is from another place. It is not of this world. And no matter what happens in this world or how bad it might get or how different it might get than our ideals and all of that, I want to tell you we are citizens of another country. And it is a country that we have not yet seen. It is a country that God calls his kingdom. 
It is a country of heaven. Pilate says, then you are a king then. Jesus says, you say that I'm a king. And then the conversation shifts just a little bit. And Jesus explains the idea of truth. And he says, the reason I was born and came into the world was to testify to truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Pilate retorts, well, what is truth? But I would say to you, Jesus has already answered that question earlier on. In John chapter 8, if anyone holds my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus says in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Mary Lefkowitz said this, and I don't necessarily embrace everything she says, but she said the notion that there are many truths might seem well-suited in a diverse society. And when everyone is free to define his or her as she prefers, the truth as they prefer, as at present, the result is an intellectual and moral shouting match in which people of the loudest voices are the most likely to be heard. Crucify him! The most powerful Sanhedrin. He subverts the nation. Pilate continues on to Jesus. What do you say about these accusations? And Jesus in verse 5 does not answer, and Pilate is absolutely mystified. Pilate's wife had a dream, said, don't mess with him. Do not mess with Jesus. So Pilate says to the people in John 18, verse 38, I find no basis to charge him. But it's your custom for me to release one prisoner in the time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? Back into Mark 15 and verse 12 summary. What will you do with Jesus? He had Jesus beaten, hoping it would appease the crowd. It did not appease the crowd. To save his hide, to keep peace and order around him, to avoid any kind of a rebel-rousing event, he gave Jesus over to them to be crucified. What will you do with Jesus? Dick Rowe was a missionary to the Philippines. And he went into the jungle area, not yet really developed well. And as he came into that area, he did not know the language of the people. The leaders of the particular village that he had stumbled into didn't know who he was. And so they went over to him, strange as this moment was, this tall, very white, white man coming into their community. And as best they could communicate, they said to him, what are you doing? What do you want? As best he could explain to them, he says, I want to learn your language. I want to tell you the words of God. They began to teach him their language. He began to learn their language. As he learned their language, he then began to translate the scriptures and he started out with the Gospel of Mark. He translated the Gospel of Mark, and then he had to come back to the United States to raise more money to do what he was doing, to be able to survive. And so, before he left, there was a young boy, about 13 years old, and he handed him the Gospel of Mark. This was a copy that he had made, and he gave him the Gospel of Mark and said, I want you to read this. Nard sat down on a rock, and he began to read in his, what he called, his heart language. As he sat there reading in his heart language, he was reading through the Gospel of Mark. He said, it's as if the characters of the Scripture came alive to me. I was there. I could see them. I could hear it. I could feel it. It was happening all around. Man, it was electrifying. I was there. And then it came to the part where... They brought Jesus for a trial, and I learned that they were going to beat him, and I learned that they were going to crucify him. And I thought, what kind of God would let his son do that? Our headhunters would never let anybody do anything like that to us. 
We want a God who is strong, stronger than the spirits that tell us to sacrifice puppies and cows and cats and all kinds of animals that we have. We want someone strong and mighty that can come and deliver us. What kind of God do you want? He said, we want that. He said, I slammed down the gospel of Mark and started walking home. And God spoke to me and said, Nard, you don't understand. I love you that much that I gave my son so you could be free. He said, something happened in my heart on that path. I went back, I picked up the gospel, and I read the rest of it. He didn't just end on a cross. They buried him and he rose from the dead. And he said, none of our people ever had that happen. I believed and he changed my life. I want to ask you, Stormy O'Mardian, what will you do with Jesus? Josh McDowell, what will you do with Jesus? Sanhedrin crowd, Pilate, Nard, now you, now me. Will you open your heart to him? I didn't ask you if you would continue to come to church and smile and look nice. I asked you if you open your heart to Christ. Many of you have. Most of us have. But some watching me today or sitting right here, you have not opened your heart to Christ. Not mental assent. Even the devils believe, the scripture says, and they tremble because they know he is and he's God's son. That's not what he wants. He wants us to believe, yeah, but he wants us to receive in our life to where he becomes not only our savior, forgiver of sin, but a Lord of our life, the Lord of our life. What will you do? with Jesus. You're going to meet him in a little bit. What will you wish then you would have done now? Father, as we march through this life, we're reminded daily that we only are passing through. We are just here for a while and then we are, we're gone. Our life is finished. Lord, we have an opportunity like many in this story today to influence other people around us. So, Lord, may we, may we receive you in every area of our life that we might influence the others around us for the glory and honor of Christ. Your death, your resurrection offer such transformation for us all. Forgiveness of sin, peace with God, new life. May we, like those last week, Open our heart to you, Lord, if there are any that have not done that or maybe are coming to you for just kind of a reconnect. I don't know. You do, and they do. So be with all of us, Lord, wherever we find ourselves in life, that we might open our heart to you. And in doing that, find the peace that surpasses understanding, purpose for our life that exceeds our own agenda and makes us right with our Creator God. We love you and thank you for dying for us. Friend, if you're sitting here today and you have never received him, you could just say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. You can say it quietly. You don't even have to say it out loud. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I recognize my sin right now. I don't want it in my life any longer. I confess it to you. I invite you to forgive my sin to come into my life. Be my savior. Lord, I give you my life, so I ask you to be my Lord. Just guide me in the way you want me to go for the days I have left on earth until the day I see you. In your name, I thank you. Amen.